This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 89, recorded on October 14th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How's it going? It's going great. You're into football out there, right? Yeah, we had a fun fun game under the lights here. We we beat Penn State and played under the lights, so the band had a really great light show, and the, and the game uh, was kind of interesting. We won. Kind of interesting. <laughs> I would think that... <laughs> well, that, uh, yeah, I won't go into the gory details, but... <laughs> <laughs> you go to every game? Um, when I'm in town, I do. do I'm a season, season ticket tickets? holder. Yeah, yeah, for both football and basketball. Cool. Yeah. Also joining us today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. We lost you for a moment there, Michael. Yeah, I bumped my mouse that was over the hang-up button. <laughs> wow, that's a Rube Goldberg kind of thing. Well, you know, it's it's Tuesday, not our normal Thursday. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys, but thank you for accommodating my schedule mix-up last week. I appreciate that. that Michael, uh, are you still warm down there? It it has been unseasonably warm. We were in the 90s over this past weekend, but the humidity was low, and there's a cold front coming through. So we've been sitting under a tornado warning oh. on and off all day. So hopefully the nasty weather as the sun goes down won't be too nasty, and we'll we'll get through this, and hopefully we'll have some cooler, drier air coming in. Well, we have a little Indian summer this week. We're in the... Uh the mid 20s celsius 24 celsius it's been chilly but now brilliant sun today it's uh kids wearing shorts today (laughs) you know go figure which is fine for me i don't mind putting off the cold weather well michelle you had a nice time out there in wisconsin didn't you i did yeah there's just some great stories um old and new how long does it take for you to get there from ann arbor uh, well, I flew, and oh, it's, flew. Um, you know, less than an hour because I, I gain an hour. Uh, you, <laughs> so did you have to go through Chicago? No, no. There are direct flights from oh. Detroit. Yep. Well, good job, Michelle. On well, your thanks. own solo, that's not an easy thing to do. But uh, you handled everybody pretty well. <laughs> I they, had fun. They seemed to have a good time, too. They really appreciated it. Great. No, those are fun things to do because you get a lot of interesting people together. We... Did one at Cold Spring Harbor, which I had a lot of fun with. Mm-hmm. And Waslaw Shabalski was at yours, right? I know. <laughs> He's going to get the prize for most <laughs> milestones. That's right. Well, that's great. Well, we're back here at the regular Twins. We have two papers for your listening pleasure today. And I will start off with the first one, which I found in a journal called eLife, which is a relatively new uh, journal uh, published jointly by... Well, I know that Howard Hughes is involved and other foundations who escape me at the moment. But uh, it's open access, so all of you can access the text and figures, which is nice. And also, I understand there's no length limit. You can write as much as you want Hmm. in eLife. So if you're publishing a long paper, I used to have a colleague who complained you couldn't write scholarly papers anymore because they were made to be too short. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Although uh, people go to the other extreme also when there's no limit they just jam it with oh, yeah. supplemental figures and it's just I find it really distracting it really disrupt disrupts the flow. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think here they're encouraging you to put most of the stuff in the uh, paper. Although there is uh is, is there supplemental data here? I don't even remember. Which there is, are supplemental yeah, there are. files. I don't really like supplemental files because you have to, you have to go somewhere else. I want them all in one place. Mm. So what do you think, Michael? Do you like supplemental figures? I don't. So I, if the I three actually, of us don't, then why are they doing it? Uh, because the authors <laughs> are impassionately asking to include all the hard work. And mm. I guess when we were generating our first primary data at the bench, we wanted everything in the paper. 
But what I tell students when I'm on their thesis committee is it's not how many experiments can I do to make a point. It's how few experiments can I do to yeah. build a solid argument. That's right. It's the binary, so. binary experiment where you get a yes or a no and no maybes. Well, and it's taxpayers' dollars, so we need to be smart about what experiments we're doing. Wow. Especially when they involve animals. I mean, we're all very sensitive for the ethical treatment of animals and some of these uh, clinical studies where, you know, in, in the paper you're going to be discussing, Michelle, they actually use live animals in order to assess the, the results of their paper. And, right. And, and they were very judicious in the number of animals that they used in order to make their point. Well, the paper I've picked caught my eye. It's called A Gene Horizontally Transferred from Bacteria Protects Arthropods from Host Plant Cyanide Poisoning. And the authors are Weibu, Dermaw, Thierry, Stevens, Gerbic, Fireisen, and Van Loyen. And they are from Belgium in various places. Uh, Department of Crop Protection at, at the Ghent University. Another department at Ghent, uh, a department in Spain, and uh, also Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So a multinational collaboration here. And this is really interesting. This is all new stuff for me. The one thing I'd like to interject before we start as a prelude to those listening, break out your old microbial physiology texts and look up amino acid biosynthesis and (laughs) look for cystinine biosynthesis because it'll help you follow along. So maybe uh, some of you know, I mean, I... That plants, some plants, um, you know, they don't want to be eaten by herbivores, right? Those are animals that eat plants. There are a bunch of them out there. So they defend themselves with, by producing hydrogen cyanide, HCN. This is called cyanogenesis. And I asked my son this morning, who was 16, you know any plants that make cyanide? And he said, apples. I said, no, they don't. He said, yeah, the seeds, the seeds, dad. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Smart kid. So um, a lot of, uh, quite a few plants, and in fact, besides the apple seeds, which I assume is true, I didn't look it up, um, apricot seeds, oh yeah, apple seeds, there it is in my list, peach seeds, and wild almonds. So if you hmm. p- if you go out in the wild and you pick wild almonds, you, you eat one, it's going to be bitter because it's got cyanide in it. You shouldn't eat too many of them because they will kill you. The cyanide is toxic. It binds to cytochrome C oxidase in your mitochondria and blocks electron transport. So you can't make ATP and eventually you'll die. It's interesting. I've also happened to be reading at, at the moment Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Oh, you haven't read that one yet? <clears throat> now nah, I'm way behind. I spend too much time podcasting. I'm oh. further behind than you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have it collecting dust. <laughs> so he talks about how these almonds are, you know, they're poisonous. But years ago, someone must have found a sweet almond out there, which was a mutant that doesn't make cyanide. And they brought that back and they farmed it. And that's the origin of all our almonds today because we don't, they, they don't have cyanide anymore, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to eat them. Anyway, that's a side trip there. So the plants make um, cyanide. So the idea is they actually, they make it to, to ward off predators. And I had another interesting example here. There's a, the Madagascar bamboo produces cyanide. There is an animal called the golden bamboo lemur, which eats this bamboo because it doesn't get poisoned by it. So plants have this offense or defense, and some of the predators have evolved to get around it. And that's what this is about today, this this whole arms race between offense, defense, offense, and defense. So plants actually don't <clears throat> contain cyanide per se. They have cyanogenic glucosides. They have compounds uh, that are converted to cyanide by the plant, by enzymes in the plant, uh, when, they're, when they're injured. This is kind of an injury response. So when an herbivore is piercing the stem or... or biting some part of the plant, I suppose. Uh, the enzymes are induced that convert the cyanogenic glucosides into cyanide. And then the, uh, the muncher gets killed, and the plant survives in theory. Of course, many of the munchers have developed uh, ways around it, as I've said. So this paper, they're looking at a particular insect, the two-spotted spider mite, Tetrancus urticae. 
normally feeds on many different cyanogenic plants, not just one. This is, this is called being polyphagous. You eat many different kinds of plants. And so they take this mite and, and they have it in the lab. They're, they've been feeding this mite for a long time on bean plants that don't make cyanide. They're called acyanogenic bean plants. Then they have the same plant with the genes in it to make cyanide. So then they transfer the mite to those plants and they pass it for 30 generations. And you know, notice I say pass because I'm thinking of viruses, right? Mm-hmm. And put one, you put a tick on a plant, you let it feed, then you move it to the next one. So you're saturating it with cyanogenic, well, cy- cyanide made by the plant. So you got two basically identical plants except for the machinery needed to make cyanide. This is so cool. Again, the idea is there are precursors in the plant that then get converted to cyanide upon the insult. So they then took these mites uh, on the the acyanogenic beans and on the cyanogenic bean plants, and they compared their transcriptomes, that is, all the mRNAs that they made. They just extract RNA from both kinds of mite, and they sequence it. They do RNA sequencing, and they compare it. So with or without uh, cyanide. And they, I think they're pretty lucky. They identified 28 genes, only 28 out of the thousands that are in this mite that went up or down more than twofold. All right, so you want a good effect, I suppose, so you get rid of the ones less than twofold. And they could easily get through these, and find, they found one, which is called uh, TUCAS, T-U-C-A-S, which encodes a predicted cytosolic protein, with very high similarity to a cysteine synthase of bacteria, okay? Now, for this, we have to talk a little bit about the the biochemistry, as Michael said. So you have cyanide, and the, the tick or whatever it is wants to get rid of it. What they do is they have an enzyme that takes the cyanide, combines it with cysteine, and makes beta cyanoalanine, which can then be used to make asparagine and aspartate as well. So you're detoxifying the cyanide by combining it with cysteine. And as we'll see later, it turns out that cysteine synthesis is also one of the things that this same enzyme can do. So the the enzyme they discovered in these mites that was induced uh, upon feeding on, on cyanide is, again, this gene 2Cas, with that, which is a has homology to bacterial cysteine synthases. So the cysteine, which is kind of in the middle of this pathway, it's, it, it's, you start with either methionine or acetylcysteine. And then you make cysteine in one of these two pathways. So there's a methionine-dependent and a methionine-independent pathway to make cysteine. And the methionine-independent pathway is catalyzed by these bacterial cysteine synthases. All right, so that's what they got. They have this enzyme that in bacteria makes cysteine, and this is something very similar uh, in the mite. And again, the the detox pathway of, of cyanide involves using cysteine, okay? Now, they compared um, this sequence of this protein 2Cas from related mites and also within butterflies, which are known to... Um, be able to detoxify uh, cyanide, and they find 20 arthropods in all that have a similar protein to this 2Cas. And then they compared the sequence with similar enzymes, cysteine synthases of plants, fungi, oomycetes, bacteria, metazoa, and basically what they come up with is the idea that this is probably a monophyletic lineage. That is, it originated with one ancestor, and all of the uh, enzymes, these cysteine synthase-like enzymes, are related to a common uh, ancestor. Moreover, it looks like the common ancestor was a bacterial enzyme. So they think that at one point, horizontal gene transfer from bacteria brought this enzyme from bacteria into all of these other organisms, including the mite, the uh, two-spotted spider mite that we're looking at in this paper. Okay, so... The, the closest sequences in bacteria are from species that are often transferred from plants to insects and become uh, endosymbionts, which we've talked about uh, here before 
uh, on TWIM, some of these endosymbionts of uh, mealybugs, for example. So the, the bacteria go from plants to insects, perhaps when the insects feed on the plant, and then the, inst- the, the bacteria donates some of its DNA, the, the insect takes it up, and then lo and behold, you have a new gene uh, in the insect. Now, one of the issues you have to deal with when you do this kind of work is you have to make sure that the, the protein, 2Cas in this case, is actually a mite protein and not from any contaminating bacteria, right? Because the, mites, the mite could have bacteria in it that has this gene, and that could simply uh, show up in your sequencing. So they did a number of cool things, which I'll just summarize. They first, they look at the position of the 2Cas gene in the mite genome. All right. Now, I, one thing I didn't tell you, the 2Cas gene of all these mites and insects, about 20 or so, they don't have introns, which of course is very typical of bacterial genes. In the mite genome, where this 2Cas gene was inserted, it's flanked by typical spliced eukaryotic genes, not only in the two-spotted mite, but also in a couple of other mite strains that they looked at. So they say this rules out a a genome assembly artifact. When you do genome sequences, you know, get short pieces of the genome you have to assemble. And you could see that if you got a a bacterium mixed in there, you could assemble it in the wrong way. So that doesn't seem to to be the case. Uh, The GC content, the amount of of guanine and cytosine in this sequence matched... um, that in the overall mite genome, not, not from other bacteria as well, further suggesting that it's, it's been in the mite genome for a while. So they believe that this and a few other uh, pieces of evidence indicate that it's not a contaminant, but it's a horizontally transferred gene from bacteria to mites. So you can imagine a long time ago, a mite got a gene from bacteria, which allowed it to survive after eating on a cyanogenic plant. And that mite and all its offspring survived. And now they have this gene that allows them to do that. So it's kind of a chance thing, but it uh, changes the way the mite lives, I guess. Well, natural selection is a, a, is a powerful force. <laughs> I sure mean, is. it was either life or death. And cyanide is such a fast-acting poison to the insect. You can well imagine how easy it is to select out. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, one of those binary screens, you know, all the ones that lack the gene – die, all the ones that have the gene live. Quite, quite so, yeah. It's a selection is amazing. Uh, the next thing they do is they took the gene encoding 2Cas, they put it in E. coli, they had the protein made, they purify it, uh, and then they show that it can do, it can carry out cysteine biosynthesis, methionine-independent cysteine biosynthesis, starting actually with serine. And it can also detoxify cyanide. So it can make beta cyanoalanine from cyanide using cysteine. Okay. And so they can they also do some work which looks at which activity is favored by this enzyme, whether it's the cysteine synthetase or the cyanide detox. And it's the cyanide detox that seems to be favored over cysteine synthesis in this mite enzyme. By the way, guys, I wanted to tell you I was in Brazil a couple of weeks ago, and they made fun of me for saying E. coli. Really? They what said they it say? should be said it should be pronounced E. coli because it's Latin after all. They said coli. I said, well, the Americans I know say coli, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> coli. <laughs> Every well, time. Well, it's the old Koch and Cock. Uh, yeah. Ed Co Ed Cock and Ed Coach or. You know, Coke and yep, Koch. yeah. It's uh, it's we. I never heard of coli before, and I'm not. There's no way I'm going to change. It's not, sixty years of saying E. coli. You know, <laughs> well, not that long, but maybe forty. Right. This two cast protein is very similar to the butterfly protein, so they suspect that butterflies also do uh, cyanide detox using this enzyme, and they say that has to be proven, of course. But uh, it looks good. Now, not all ticks have two cas. This spider mite, two-spotted spider mite, and a few others. So the horizontal gene transfer from the bacteria probably took place after the line of ticks split and became multi-ticks from one. So it didn't happen at the very beginning of the tick lineage. I wonder if those other ticks have a different strategy for dealing with cyanide. 
Or maybe they don't feed on cyanogenic plants, right? Mm -hmm. They all died. They tried and died. <laughs> they tried and died. <laughs> I don't know if there'd be any memory though, right? You just right. make a lot of ticks and some of them die and some of them don't. Yep. Uh, butterflies probably, their, their gene is different enough. These guys think that they probably got a separate horizontal transfer. So this is not a terribly rare event. You know, bacteria giving everybody DNA all the time. Whoever will take it. Um, you know, the bacteria in our gut we take. And uh, so it's a pretty frequent occurrence. Um, we talked about the uh, mealybug uh, planococcus on TWIM74. And this um, endosymbiont, this mealybug, uh, has a sequence very much like this enzyme, the cysteine synthetase-like sequence, derived from its bacterial endosymbiont. Okay, we, and that, that's been known for a couple of years now. And I just, Planococcus is a, I think a sap sucker, mm -hmm. right? So it might encounter cyanide from time to time. So, you know, it could be that they also maintain this enzyme after getting it from bacteria as well. So that is basically the story. I, I just want to add two more really neat um, pieces of information. In butterflies, this, ca this uh, gene, two cas like gene, has been duplicated after it was got, acquired from bacteria. And the butterfly needs the multiple doses of the gene because apparently they, butterflies can not only eat cyanogenic plants, but they make cyanogenic compounds themselves. So they, oh. need, a, they need a lot of this gene. And apparently it helps um, to defend against predators. So there are people who want to eat butterflies, right? And they munch on it and they die because the butterfly is making cyanide. And apparently also it allows them to store reduced nitrogen that they use for other things later on. So it's cool. It's acquired. The butterfly acquired this gene and then evolved to require it. It's just really neat. Um, and they speculate that the cysteine, this is the second cool point I want to make, the cysteine synthase activity, which is part of the dual activity of this 2-cas protein, they think that activity is why you can find this enzyme in organisms that don't eat plants because they think it probably can, in what they, they call it, enhancing the sulfur amino acid economy. So they don't need to use methionine to make cysteine. They can make cysteine from serine. Okay, so you don't need to have sulfur to do that. So in other words, it helps you to gain independence. On these, these bugs that eat a lot of different plants, the polyphagus what is it? Yeah, polyphagous lifestyle. You never know what kind of nutrients you're going to get from different plants. So if you can make your cysteine without methionine, that may be useful. So another another use for having this acquired gene. Anyway, I thought that was a cool story. I learned 100% of what I told you. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> it's, and, it's, and that's what's cool about you know sulfur amino acids is the form of sulfur is always – um, sulfur minus two, and mm -hmm. you can bring the sulfur in as SO4, SO3, thiol sulfate, and it's that transformation process because there's only so much H2S to go around, and H2S by itself mm. is, is toxic. And that was once upon a time in ancient times, that was the form probably in the primordial soup of, of the sulfur in biosynthesis was hydrogen sulfide. Mm. And then, of course, uh, it got transformed because everybody was using it for energy and and then these other systems evolved to um, move the sulfur around because of its reactivity and you know cysteine is is very important for everything from disulfide bonding to the reactive um, moiety in in enzymes because mm, of that sure. uh, protonated and unprotonated form of of the amino acid. So if you could make cysteine from other than a sulfur-containing compound, that could help you. No, no, no. You need the sulfur, but from the reduced, the the penal, the ultimately reduced sulfur, the right. H2S. H2S, yeah. You can use that instead of methionine, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was um, struck by um, how interdisciplinary your, your talk just was. We tend to classify ourselves as bacteriologists or virologists, mm -hmm. but, but uh, really understanding biochemistry, evolution, genetics, uh, it all comes together, which is why our jobs are so fascinating, huh? Yeah, I always say microbiology is an integrative science. You have yep. to know everything, not just the bacteria, right? We're uh, never bored. Nope. 
No. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is a great paper. It's a little tough to read because, as Michael said, there's a lot of biochemistry in there. They also assume you know a lot of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So I found myself having to go look stuff up. But it's pretty neat, and uh, I learned a ton. So that's... Yeah. And they do provide this helpful biochemical um, overview of the synthetic yeah. pathway, so that helps. To figure one is good. I just think it's cool how you all the tech, all the new technology is brought together on an old biochemical problem here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would encourage cool. the undergraduates who listen to TWIM to take a look at this paper because it's in open access, so you can download it because they have everything from thin layer chromatography in the paper to mass spec. And you, you can review some of the techniques you're learning about in your molecular biology class, your biochemistry class. And it's, it's really a primer of how you assemble a toolkit in order to tell a nice story, just like Vincent just did. Yeah, it's actually a good paper for a journal club. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty neat, and you can show pictures of two spotted spider mites. <laughs> Michelle, what do you have for us? Something completely different. <laughs> um, the paper is entitled TLR2 Signaling Decreases Transmission of Streptococcus Pneumoniae by Limiting Bacterial Shedding in an Infant Mouse Influenza A Co-Infection Model. And the authors are Amy Richard, Stephen Siegel, Jan Erickson, and Jeff Weiser. And they did this work at Penn in Philadelphia. So I chose it because for a couple reasons. I think the experiments are really elegant and I think they're, they'll be easy for our audience to envision. Um, but also anybody who is breathing right now is probably thinking about Ebola and transmission. And so it'll give us an opportunity to talk a bit about fundamental principles of transmission. So um, the take-home lesson um, probably is easy to understand also. Um, basically, if you've got the flu virus and you are shedding a lot of mucus from your nose and your mouth, you're more apt to spread the bacteria that are in your nasopharynx to others. And in particular, um, strep pneumo or pneumococcus um, is a bacterium that colonizes a lot of us. It's, it's only reservoir as humans. And it um, can colonize as much as 80% of, of children. And most people can carry it without a problem. But if you have a second infection or you have a um, break in your skin or a, a defect in one of your other um, immune defenses, like uh, you're, if you're a smoker and you don't have great mucociliary elevator in your um, respiratory tract, you can, it can get into your lungs. So this um, bacterium, although people carry it very commonly, it also causes 1.6 million deaths a year uh, globally. Um, it can cause pneumonia or ear infections or more serious infections like um, sepsis or meningitis. So it's an opportunistic um, pathogen. And the model system that allowed them to do these um, experiments was developed by um, a group at the University of Melbourne in Australia. This is Odilia Wijsberg's lab. Um, and they published in 2010 this infant mouse model for studying transmission of pneumococcus from one mouse um, to another. And they had initially reported that um, as... Weiser's group reports here that um, co-infection with flu virus does increase transmission. So the contribution the Weiser paper makes is to look in more detail at the mechanism and look at some of the host factors that um, prevent that transmission and um, uh, keep this um, bacterium from spreading more easily in the population. So in pathogenesis, we are very good at studying uh, infection in a particular cell or in a particular um, animal, but we're, we don't have very good methods or we haven't put a lot of effort into studying transmission. That is, how does the agent get from one infected host to another? And the reasons are many, but basically it's more expensive. Um, if you want to study transmission from one animal to another, you've got to use a lot more animals. And also, um, animal behavior impacts on transmission, and that's just harder to control in the lab. So in general, we just haven't invested as much in studying transmission. And so uh, that is one of the, the um, values, I think, of, of this um, paper and their system. 
So the experiments are really um, simple. They are using um, infant mice. And so these um, mice are between four, eight, and 12 days um, after birth. So they are um, about the size of your little finger and they're um, pink and squirmy. Um, they start to get hair after about 10 days or so, but most of the experiments um, are going to be um, done with, imagine these little um, squirmy embryos that are no bigger than your little finger. So the first experiment is to um, just verify that they can colonize these infant mice with strep pneumo. So they collect these um, uh, newborn pups, and then use just a pipette to put a few drops of suspended uh, bacteria just to dab it right under the nose. And then the, the um, mouse, when it's inhaling, will inhale that up into their nasopharynx, and the bacterium can, can colonize. So the experiment then was to uh, first show that they could colonize these infant mice, and then put them back um, in the cage with their litter mates and take half of the litter mates and also then use a similar uh, technique, drop a little bit of a suspension of the flu virus on their um, underneath their nose, have them inhale that, and then wait um, another week and then take the animals again and basically um, use a saline solution to wash everything that's out of their that's in their nasal passage into a tube and then plate it out and count how many bacteria are in, in each mouse. And so in figure one, for example, they are able to establish that if the mouse has received first um, strep pneumo and then flu, they are 47% of the, of the pups then are able to spread that um, bacterium to a neighbor uh, litter mate. Whereas if they don't have the flu virus, none of them spread the bacterium to their um, litter mate. So giving them the strep pneumo has no effect on the mice? It doesn't kill them? It doesn't kill them. That's no, right. It's, it's going to colonize. I it mean, just colonize, colonizes yeah. ju like, like humans or like small children. But yes, normally so, mice don't have this bacterium, right? That's right. They have to, and, and in fact, they can't use adult mice because the adult um, are not well colonized. Mm. Okay. Um, so that's why they have to use these infant mice. Mm -hmm. So then they look at more detail and ask if a um, particular component of the innate immune system is contributing to um, defense against um, these infections. And so this is a toll-like receptor, TLR2. Uh, so in general, these are proteins that sit on the surfaces of our cells and they can sense um, microbial products. So in particular, this TLR2 receptor can uh, recognize a variety of microbial proteins and um, products, including a uh, component of the cell wall of gram-positive bacter gram bacteria, lipotocoic acid. So the experiments they do um, are to take infant mice now that lack the TLR2 receptor and do the same type of colonization experiments with the, with the bacteria and the flu virus. And they find that if you lack this innate immune receptor, TLR2, you have increased colonization. On the other hand, if they pre-stimulate the TLR2 receptor to fire up that immune defense pathway, then there is less colonization. So nice experiments in figure two uh, establish that um, toll-like receptor two contributes to host resistance to colonization. They then go on to ask whether absence of the TLR2 pathway um, impacts the ability to spread the bacteria from the one infant mouse to its litter mate. And so that data is in um, figure 2C, where we see that if the... Um, index mouse, so that's the um, mouse that was intentionally infected, lacks TLR2, then they are able to spread the bacterium to 89% um, of wild-type litter mates that they are in close contact with. So, um, and that's opposed to, as opposed to um, if they have TLR2 receptor, the um, frequency of transmission is um, considerably less. Are these are are these in the presence of influenza as well or not? So that is, let me look at Figure Two C. That is mm -hmm. um, in the 
Yeah, they say they infected as in one figure one A, so it must yeah, have flu. in the presence of, of okay. flu virus as well. So then they want to look in more detail. Um, they because it's known that TLR two when it's activated um, triggers inflammation. They decide to look directly at a hallmark of inflammation, and an easy marker is to look at um, the influx of a white blood cell called a neutrophil. So these are white blood cells that are normally, um, as the name implies, circulating in our bloodstream, but when um, infection is sensed, these white blood cells can squeeze out of the blood vessels into the tissue, crawl very quickly over to the infection, and eat um, bacteria very um, efficiently. So they are a kind of the first line of defense, first responders, typically in infections. And um, what they are able to show in their mouse model is that if the mice only see, have only been exposed to strep pneumo, there are very few neutrophils in their um, nasopharynx. But if they were first exposed to flu and then uh, exposed to uh, strep pneumo, they have a higher bacterial load, as we saw in the earlier figures, but they also have um, uh, much more, many more um, neutrophils in their um, nasal passages. So that's a direct measure that there is, in fact, more inflammation when you have the combination of flu and strep pneumo. So next, they um, want to look at the impact of uh, TLR on that pathway. That is, look directly at whether TLR2 is responsible for the recruitment of the neutrophils. So in figure three, um, they do the experiment in either wild-type mice or mice that lack this um, component of the innate immune system, TLR2. And um, as you'd expect, they see more um, neutrophils in the animals that lack this um, uh, defense pathway. And you and people recognize neutrophils when they're sick because it's what gives that whitish, yellowish appearance to the things that you blow out of your nose. That's right. Uh, and as you're getting in, as you get into pathogenesis, you take neutrophils for granted. And you know, it's it's really. I always try to bring it back when I talk to the medical students about this, so that they can relate it to to their patients and their family. I actually. The, how remarkable neutrophils are. They're, they're the most abundant of these white blood cells that we have, and they are this essential part of our innate immune system that do so many important things for us. Another example that our audience might be familiar with is if you get a splinter, and then it starts that area starts to fill with pus, and if you pop that or give it a squeeze, that cloudy fluid that comes out, mm -hmm. those, again, the cloud there is... Um, due to infiltration of these uh, neutrophils. So they've come screaming into the site and are trying to clean up any, um, any trouble. So the last experiment I'll describe is, um, is kind of an elegant one. They want to ask directly whether um, mice that lack the TLR2 receptor or that have flu virus, have been exposed to flu virus, um, whether they in fact have more bacteria in their uh, nasal secretions. And so the way this experiment is done is to take these infant mice and take them out of, away from their mom and out of the cage and then gently press their nose onto bacteriological auger. This is and such that, a cool experiment. Isn't that great? I mean, this is so cool. Can you see it. yourself doing this, picking up this thing the size of your itty bitty pinky <laughs> yep. and putting their little nose next to a petri plate, waiting for them to exhale so that you can actually inoculate the plate? This is not really high tech science, but it's a high tech experiment. It's so direct. Yeah. That's what I think is so elegant about it. Yeah. So they, so they did, and I keep saying they, it's Amy Richards, and I'll tell you more about Amy in a moment. But um, so she was able to take from this uh, litter of, of pups the mice out at day eight and press their nose against the auger plate at day nine, day 10, all the way to day 14, and then count the number of bacterial colonies um, from each infant mouse. And so when she does that experiment with mice that have only been exposed to strep pneumo, we see in figure 5C that there are no, um, no colonies detected. Now, if they had flu virus first, then um, you can begin to see colonies um, after about two weeks, appreciable numbers. If they lack the TLR2 receptor 
and had flu and then and had strep, um, then the numbers increase um, thousands of fold. So you have some of the mice have as many as 6,000 um, uh, uh, CFUs um, in their nasopharynx. And so you don't a, have to be a fancy statistician to look at this. I mean, it's right. night night and day on the slide. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And what, and what Amy pointed out is that these infant mice, so, so I should back up, when we do experiments with adult mice, we can tag each animal. Um, we can nip their ear and put a little number so that when we have a cage full, we know who's number one, two, three, four. So if you go back to that animal each day, you can keep track of, of its behavior. They can't mark these little infant mice. There's just not a good way to tag them. And so what, what they've done in this figure is display the cage worth. So we can't, it's a mm-hmm. scatter plot, in other mm-hmm. words, um, rather than following in a linear diagram each mouse over the two-week period. But nevertheless, the the picture is very clear that um, if you first have flu virus and then um, are exposed to pneumo, or or I'm sorry, it's the other way around. If you have pneumo and then are exposed to flu, you get an inflammatory response as measured by um, increased number of neutrophils. And they also measure increase in cytokines, a second hallmark of inflammation. And you've got many more um, bacteria uh, that can be shed in those secretions, and you can either count them on a plate or you can observe that they are more easily spread to the litter mates. And one of the elegant, other elegant uh, features of this model is that these mice are still uh, nursing, and so we know that a mother um, will f- can can nurse several pups at once. And so you can imagine during all that slurping, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, secretions uh, being inhaled, <laughs> mm. and uh, it's a it's a very easy way then for um, transmission from one pup to a neighboring pup. Yeah. Whereas once they're adults, they're not in such close proximity, and perhaps that's why um, there's not as much uh, shedding and spreading of these um, of the bacteria among adult mice. Hmm. Is the flu dependent shedding simply a matter of secretions or? Is there some more specific effect? The reason I ask is that Michael did a paper on Twim a while ago where, was it with strep pneumo showing it? It, it, it was. And it, so it, they biofilmed a planktonic induced by, by flu infection. These are probably correct. in older mice, though, right? These were in older mice, but I think it's likely the same signaling that's going on between the flu virus and the uh, bacteria. And so consequently, I think it actually may account for the, because in these data that are associated with just putting the the microbe into the nose of the infant mouse, it stays there and it doesn't come out. Hmm. But when you give it the flu, it comes out. So that's implying that you've gone from an engrafted state and they did some experiments where they were squirting uh, sailing up the nose of the animal and recovering bacteria, and the so neti pot experiment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think the the two papers go go together. So we'll put in the show notes that paper about uh, the virus triggering the biofilm behavior change in influenza and strep pneumo, and it taken in concert with this one. It really begins to illustrate. This, this tour de force of how bacteria and viruses and the host all get together to create the havoc that's, that's going on. And as Michelle said in the introduction, you know, unless you've been living under a rock these past few months, this is really the great fear with Ebola running loose. I mean, what are the triggers that are facilitating the spread of, of Ebola? Yeah, and if we can understand the host pathways that contribute to that shedding and transmission, then that gives us another um, avenue to tr- to reduce um, infection in the population. This is a real problem because I don't know in the in the bacterial world, but in viruses, we really do not understand what distinguishes viruses in terms of transmission. You know, some mm-hmm. are some are easy. Some are IV drug use. Some are sexually transmitted. Some are arthropod born, but there are those that are transmitted by contact or droplets like Ebola. And then we, yeah. have, then we have the aerosols like influenza. We don't really understand at all what regulates that. Some people have tried to look at it w- with flu, with ferret models, 
and people kind of freak out when those experiments get published because they're saying, oh, we're going to make a, a dangerous pathogen. The ferret but, will get loose or something. But we need to do these experiments because we have zero understanding. Mm -hmm. And right now, many people in the world are freaking out over the idea that Ebola virus may change to become aerosol transmitted. Right. And I think this, more than anything, reflects uh, not understanding that we really don't understand transmission at all. We don't have the data to argue one way or the other. I, I've been trying to figure out how many Ebola viruses it takes to come in contact with an individual in order to trigger an infection. And I've read, you know, I've been digging through the literature trying to f figure out this number because it's what's essential for controlling the risk uh, to healthcare workers. Is it one, one piece of data I read was suggesting it's between one and 10 viruses is the infectious dose. Mm. And I haven't been able to find any other references to, to confirm or, or I haven't found the paper yet. I just read it well, in one of these throwaways. Let me state the obvious. Um, we don't do transmission experiments, especially with agents that we have no treatment for. Correct. Right? That's absolutely correct. <laughs> Does not happen. And well, you, no one in the United States, with the exception of, you know, the the four laboratories and, you know, that there's that great TWIM or TWIV video on uh, the needle, mm -hmm. where which all those experiments are done under level four containment. And, you know, they're, they're very challenging conditions to work under. Uh, Vincent had to get into the, the zoot suit, as they say, uh, and it was really hard pipetting, wasn't it? It's not easy. You really have to be trained, uh, but it's the way to totally protect yourself. And they do do animal um, experiments with these fire with animal, Ebola. Yes, they don't do transmission, but they do animal because th we have a couple of vaccines that are ready to go into people on phase one, and to test those in animals, they had to be done in BSL four uh, facilities. Mm. Um, but we don't understand what regulates transmission. Now, I should just add that. We have never seen a human virus change the way it's transmitted. In over 100 years of studying viruses, I always say, we've never seen it change. I think it's very hard to change your mode of transmission. Yeah, the, the analogy I would use is that if you have um, had a successful, long and successful career as an accountant, the likelihood that the next day you're going to walk into a restaurant and be the, <laughs> the head chef, it's great. It's <laughs> just not going to happen, right? I mean, it could theoretically, it sure, could happen, sure, in but theory, right. so many steps would be required to get from one to the next. That yes. It's highly unlikely. And I also think there are I think there are reasons why that's so. I think viruses adapt to a certain way of transmitting, and then everything is put into place to accommodate that. And if you changed it, you're going to mess things up. And an example is when H5N1 avian influenza virus was adapted to spread by aerosol between ferrets, that virus lost its virulence. In mm -hmm. right. So you gain one thing, you lose another. You know, nature does this wonderful meshing of the gears, the evolutionary gears, if you will, to make everything work together. And then we go in, we change a gene, and we think this is going to work. I mean, it's just very naive, right? Well, viruses especially, they're so compact, little yep. machines. So, so with viruses, a big part of the transmission, I would suspect, would be how stable the virus is on a surface. So the transmission... Uh, in aerosols, depends on stability in the droplets. Right. right? And, and exposure to air. Exposure oxygen. to the air so has to be resistant to drying, has mm -hmm. to be resistant to UV as mm -hmm. well. So you, Ebola is not very U resistant to UV. If you shine UV light on it, you can inactivate it. Although if you keep it in the dark at room temperature, it can last for quite a while, but it has to be in the How dark. How long is quite a while? A couple, of, a couple of days, yes. There is mm -hmm. a paper on that. A few days in the dark, uh, in in moist environment, but this is not a subway pole, so this is not going to happen most likely. Yeah, I think also the amount of virus in each droplet is important, right? If you make right. if you only make a few PFU, it might not be good at transmitting, and maybe higher replication levels are important. But those are the simplistic, obvious things. I'm, there's got to be more that we just don't know about. Right? And it's you know it's it's Ebola's envelope, right, Vincent? It is. And uh, so it's it's coming off with our spots on it, and uh, this <laughs> lipid, uh, you know, we there are a lot of disinfectants out that specifically go after 
the enveloped uh, viruses and its single-stranded RNA, mm -hmm. which anyone who's ever looked cross-eyed at RNA knows that it'll it'll break down. Yeah, which is good news for. So not not a hardy, not a real hardy virus. Not terribly hardy, fortunately. No, not like our picornas that can go through your gut and come out and are really happy. Yeah, norovirus is the, yeah, the, those the two. best example. It can <laughs> it can sit out there for a long period of time on on metal surfaces and and just be hunky dory. And you know you just need a very few few viruses, you know ones to tens, yeah, in right. order to get sick. And so that's why I was very interested in trying to understand the infectious dose because it really drives the discussion that the CDC is having with everyone over how often do you have to disinfect the area that you're treating the, the patients in? Um, you know, does it really represent a hazard uh, for point-of-care testing or uh, if you're taking the samples back to the lab? Um, so all of those things are, are becoming very important to the discussion that everyone seems to be having across the country over how to protect healthcare workers in this this crisis. The WHO today announced that they are anticipating uh, 10,000 new cases a week, I think, is what the, the headline came across my desk when I was eating lunch. I think they're saying that by next week there'll be 10,000 total cases. Oh, 10,000 total cases, not yeah. 10,000 cases per no. week. If I may, I'd like to change to a somewhat yeah, more upbeat area of <laughs> Up, microbiology, which is beer. Um, so, beer. So, yeah, and I'm going to make the connection. So the first author on this paper is Amy Richard. She was born and raised. She and I uh, were able to catch up and, and have a chat last week. Um, she was uh, raised in Massachusetts, went to Harvard got her first taste of, of research in microbial pathogenesis when she worked as an undergrad with um, Darren Higgins uh, there on uh, Listeria, I believe. And then she uh, came here to Michigan um, to my department and was a PhD student with um, Victor Rita, got her PhD uh, a couple years ago and is now happily uh, employed as a um, quality control technician at the Dog Fish Head Brewery in Delaware. Hmm. So her job is to monitor this craft brewery. Um, they, they monitor each stage of the brewing process. She'll take a sample and then plate and check what the, um, what the bacterial and, and fungal uh, composition is of the beer at each stage to make sure that they're on track and it hasn't been picked up some um, microbe that would um, sour the beer, for example. Hmm. So Amy was um, a, a craft brewer um, here while she was a PhD student. She won some awards at local uh, competitions. So it's really neat that um, she was the first PhD hired uh, by the Dogfish Head Brewery um, to be their chief microbiologist. Hmm. Was this her, P her postdoc, this paper? Uh, this that's right. I skipped that. I'm sorry. After her, um, <laughs> after her time, <laughs> you her to beer. <laughs> she did go work with Jeff Weiser and do this beautiful work on pneumococcus uh, transmission, and then um, got the job as a uh, at the brewery. A brew mistress. It's interesting. Yeah. Dogfish head. I went to a talk in. Uh, by the way, I was in Australia, Michelle, and they they told me how to pronounce Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they had a talk at this meeting. It was, Amer it was the Australian Society for Microbiology meeting that I attended by this fellow who uh, investigates ancient brews. They unearth them in archaeological digs. They figure out what's, what they're made of, and then they try and reproduce them. And Dogfish Head is one of the breweries that's involved in this. They try and make old, old brews, basically. Oh, cool. And they have a couple that you can find in the brew store that are, you know, supposedly thousands of years old. And uh, they found a few milliliters in the bottom of a, a, a clay jar, and they do mass spec, and they try and reproduce it. Wow. It's pretty cool. It is. Anyway, these polymicrobial infections are getting more and more attention because we're learning that, you know, the laboratory reductionist approach of one microbe per animal is not, not the way it is out there. That's right. So this and is cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. That's a very cool paper. It's uh, it, So then we had Michael's where in Michael's paper that he did a while ago, they showed that putting influenza in disrupts the biofilm and the bacteria go uh, into the bloodstream. And so that could also contribute to shedding uh, as well. That's pretty neat. 
I, I, I think I failed to say this paper was published in PLOS Pathogens, uh, which is freely accessible. That's right. So we'll link to it and our readers who are interested can look at, at, at the details. And I also um, got from Amy a photograph of her pressing the nostrils of, of one of these infant mice to uh, infant mice against the auger plate. Um, so we can include that as well. Oh, Wonderful. We can use that in yep. the show notes. Good. Send, you the, bet. Send, send it along. All right. Let's read a couple of email. The first one is from Peter who writes, Dear Michelle, Uh, Professor... My first email. Your first fan (laughs) mail. (laughs) Professor Shabalski might have been referring to a truck with a wood gas generator, and he gives a link to a Wikipedia page on this. Apparently, they are still in use north of the border from where I live. Best regards from Incheon. Now, you know what he's referring to, right, Michelle? Uh, Yes. Do you want want to tell us or not? No, you can. (laughs) It's your your story. It's okay. Um. It has to do with, um, so at University of Wisconsin-Madison, they have a large uh, research consortium now looking at biofuels. And one of the um, professors there, Emeritus, um, brought up that this is an old idea. And he described um, vehicles that um, apparently you you threw logs into the back of the truck and burned the fuel. And then that, that um, mm, the yeah. gas that was generated then powered the engine of the vehicle. I have a Wikipedia page here that shows that. And that was Wash Law. Okay, very and nice. And if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. Yeah, right. Absolutely. The next email is from Adam, who writes, Hi, Twim Crew. Often while reading articles or micro textbooks, I see something along the lines of bacterium X ferments sugar Y. Could you please provide more detail into what this means? Based on my limited knowledge, I was under the impression that many different sugars eventually make their way through glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation which is different from a fermentation pathway. I hope this is clear and you can see why I'm confused. Thank you for all you do. Yes, Michael. The simple definition is when you have the sugar, it's a reduced carbon compound. And if it ferments it, it will oxidize the sugar without sending the electrons associated with the carbon of that sugar to oxygen. Mm -hmm. So it will end up as an organic acid or um, an alcohol or or something along those lines. So fermentation simply means the oxidation of a carbon, a reduced carbon compound where the electrons go to something other than the terminal electron acceptor for oxidative phosphorylation, which is Mm -hmm. oxygen. And many sugars can be fermented, right? Yes, many sugars can be fermented. So. And and uh, there are some bacteria that can ferment sugars. The, the best example that will immediately come to mind is E. coli is noted because it has the ability to ferment lactose. Mm-hmm. And other microbes don't because E. coli is a coliform, which operationally means it can ferment um, lactose with the production of acid and gas – and the acid is where the electrons are going, and the gas, principally CO2, hydrogen, are waste products that are uh, the microbe is dumping the waste carbon into, and in the case of hydrogen, the waste electrons. Right. All right. There you go, Adam, from the expert on fermentation. Robin writes, why eukaryotes have bigger genomes? And this is in reference to TWIV80. TWIV? Is it TWIV? No, it's it twim. twim. It's got to be twim. Yeah, twim eighty. Twiv eighty one would be years ago. Cold iron email uh, with respect to Cryptococcus genome larger than protozoa. He writes the ingestion of a aerobic bacterium mitochondrion by an archaean formed the eukaryote. The eukaryote mitochondrion has shrunk its genome to that whose ongoing activity is necessary for its metabolic function in the supportive cytosolic milieu. The rest has been shed with some intermittently needed sequences seeded to the nucleus. Thus, the multiple mitochondria can support the maintenance and function of a hell of a lot more nuclear DNA. And he links to a video called Is Complex Life a Freak Accident? Which is a uh, a lecture by uh, Dr. Nick Lane, which is uh, all about natural selection and um, how things happen randomly as we've talked about on this show. And so maybe that's uh, what all of life is. Yeah, an accident. Why not? Scott writes, Good day, Team Twim. 
regarding TWIM-77, where you guys spoke of bacteria sim- stimulating sensory neurons to induce pain sensation, and by doing so, decrease the local immune response. I was wondering how various painkillers would affect this mechanism. Thanks for all the great podcasts. Hope there's many more to come. Scott is from Perth, Western Australia. He probably knows how to pronounce Melbourne. He does. Mm, absolutely. I don't know. You know, these painkillers do different things. I don't think any of them hit. So that these well, pain some of them, the they? NSAIDs prevent inflammation. Yeah. So this was um, these the neurons release um, compounds. So the bacteria stimulate neurons, which release compounds that. Uh, I, I think the inflammation. I don't even remember the paper anymore, but it, it causes the same receptors, the noce receptors, which are involved in pain. Uh, that those compounds induce uh, decrease the local immune response. So I don't know if the, the pain receptors hit that specifically. You know, there, there are a couple of different method, mechanisms of their action, but this is just not my um, cup of tea. You know nor is it my expertise. I looked up painkillers, and they do have different mechanisms. And as far as I could see, they didn't go for the nociceptors. Okay, now I'm sure people are working on that. But I, I don't believe that uh, at the moment our currently over-the-counter pain mechanisms, uh, medications do this, Scott. But that's just my two cents. Samantha writes, hello, I listen to your podcasts a lot. You always ask people to email in. So, I have a really cheeky question. I figure it's worth an ask. I'm an undergrad biomedical science student in the UK, but I love microbiology. I'm currently writing my dissertation on whether or not phage therapy is an appropriate avenue to pursue in the war against antibiotic resistance, specifically in Staphylococcus aureus. That's her working title. I decided to look at phage therapy after listening to one of your podcasts. If you are ever looking for a topic to review papers on, would you consider papers on phage therapy specifically against Staph A? I've learned so much from listening to your podcasts. I would love to hear what you find and say about the above topic. Well, Samantha, if you're if you're writing a dissertation, I'm afraid we're just going to be too late for you because it's probably <laughs> already been months since you've sent this letter. <laughs> so don't wait for us. But it is. I endorse it. It's a fascinating topic. Yeah, we we did a twim on it. Uh, Jeff Miller's paper on using yeah. phage therapy for acne. That's right. And I have a one word answer that is going to limit the effectiveness of of phage therapy, and that's lysogeny, because many of the staphylococci are uh, lys- are lysogenically infected with phage, and mm-hmm. they can f- have immunity proteins that prevent other phage from infecting them. And um, going back probably 100 years, we typed a lot of phage. I mean, we typed a lot of Staph aureus using phage. And that's why there are many different strains of Staph, simply because there were phages that would plaque on uh, a particular Staph aureus. And so the struggle with an effective phage therapy for Staph aureus, it's going to be a cocktail of phage that can target the particular strain that's causing the infection in the individual. And so you're almost going to have to know the chicken that is infecting the person so that you can go and find the egg well in advance of the in- infection. So it's, it's challenging. There's the Georgians <laughs> um, have been doing this for uh, well over 100 years, I think using um, phage isolated from the local rivers and soils to develop phage therapies. And they're constantly changing the cocktail that they sell to administer. So this- And those are Georgians in Eastern Europe. Yes, Georgian. Well, she's she's from the United (laughs) Kingdom. So I I didn't think I needed to uh, delineate. Normally I get- Just for our American listeners. For our American listeners, that's right. Not, not in Atlanta, uh, the, uh, the other Georgia. So I think it's a really fascinating topic. Uh, Nature, after the general meeting, uh, ran a story on phage therapy. Again, it, it has about a spike every 10 years in interest as people begin to look at, it, at using it as an ethical pharmaceutical. 
Well, if we come if we come across one on staff A, we'll do that for you, Samantha. But um, you better write your paper. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Bob writes, hi, Twim folk. I was listening to Twim 77 tonight on the topic of Staph aureus mouse models in pain. Uh, this is what we just talked about. You discussed the parallels between the response to the microbe-generated agents with respect to triggering a response in the neural cells and the similar response to capsaicin, as well as the result of that response reducing inflammation. This made me think about the topical capsaicin products that are used for pain relief and if their effect may come from a similar response. Yeah, I think that... May be so. The, the capsaicin is the uh, active pain-inducing ingredient in pepper, right? In some mm-hmm. pepper, mm-hmm. Hot yeah. peppers, and this. So I don't know too much about this, but I know for people with chronic pain, these are often used. The idea is that they overstimulate the nociceptors and basically shut them off, and that helps with your pain, right? So if you eat a lot of hot food, eventually you don't mind it anymore because you've overstimulated your pain receptors and. And you know, maxed out. Maxed out. So that's the idea with the capsaicin products. But in light of our paper, it may have another activity in, in reducing inflammation. You might be onto that, Bob. Yeah. I'm working my way backward through the TWIM episodes and am thoroughly enjoying them. I'm a software engineer by training and profession, but have been working with biologists on an NIH bioinformatics project at Argonne National Laboratory for the last 11 years or so. And I have been able to mostly keep up with your excellent explanations of the science. Thanks for your great work, Bob. We are hanging out with good people, biologists. Mm. <laughs> there you go, Bob. And that group at Argonne is is uh, just fantastic. I mean, they're doing the uh, hospital microbiome. They're they're looking at all sorts of really cool things in that bioinformatics group at Argonne National Labs. And Michelle, that's where Howard Schumann is. Did you know that? Argonne. Um, just outside of Chicago, right? At the University of Chicago near Naperville. Yeah, yep. so he's got an appointment at U Chicago, and he's doing something at the Argonne. That's where he left. That's right. Here yep. for, but I don't know where, what he does, or or uh, is far away from uh, Chicago. Does it take a long time? No, it's a I suburb. don't think it's very it's far. It's a suburb. No. Suburb. Okay, you know it's Howard, just... right, uh, Michelle? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to graduate school together at Columbia? Um. Almost. I was Almost. A, I was a student in his class. Oh, when he at first Columbia. got there. That's right. As as was Dr. Racanella. You were um you were oh, you worked with Marion Carlson, not with Howard. That's right. But you knew Howard. There's you know all, Yeah, all I took his class and right. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, let's do one more here. Rick writes, Dear Dr. Racaniello and Associates, a new firm. That's right. I so enjoy Twim, Twiv, and Twip. Thank you for providing such stimulating podcasts. You are a national, no global, no, you are a national, no, global treasure, and your contributions to both lay and scientific understanding will prove to be a lasting legacy. Rick, I'm cutting this out and putting it on my refrigerator. Do it, do it. That's put beautiful. It on, should tell your dean, you know. <laughs> your dean. My dean will not care. I'll tell your dean. You tell my dean. <laughs> <laughs> I read this news clip about an interesting use of carbon nanotubes to stimulate T-cell growth. Please comment on where this new direction might lead. Are there other breakthroughs in the programming and use of cytotoxic T-cells to combat cancer you might wish to highlight? So this is an article about so to grow T-cells from people and culture, it's not easy. You have to give them IL-2. Actually, this is something discovered by Robert Gallo many, many G- years ago. And GC, I always get the, the granulite stimulating, G- granulite G- colony GMCSF. stimulating. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, this, uh, it turns out if you put, put them on a layer of carbon nanotubes, um, they need less IL-2. They grow better in culture. So um, if you're doing applications where you have to put them back in people, this could be useful. So, for example, a lot of in a lot of applications now, you can take out immune cells, modify them in some way, put them back. One application now is to make them resistant to HIV infection. You can put them back. You can put more back, and therefore have a more diverse um, population. And also for cancer therapy, people are modifying T cells so that they target specific antigens on cancer cells. So you could grow them in culture. So if this turns out to be useful, I don't know because this is a Yale University, um, you know, announcement, and they 
They would like to promote what their guys are doing, of course, but it has a lot of potential, Rick. Well, Boeing in, in South Carolina is looking to, they generate a lot of waste from generating the new um, uh, 787 Dreamliner, which is made out of all carbon fiber. So we might be able to uh, think about using some of their waste to grow some of these things. So it's no metal on that plane, is that right? Or well, there's metal at certain hard points, but yeah. uh, for the most part, the wings and fuselage are carbon fiber. They actually bake it in a giant autoclave that can fit an airplane. Wow. So it's lighter? Better it's lighter, lighter and stronger. Hmm. You have, have you flown one, Michael? No, I have never. No, I the the planes fly away from Charleston and never come back. <laughs> <laughs> Our airport is too small, and Boeing makes them here, and they fly away, and we never will get service by them because they're a double-aisled plane. And but they lucky. leave lots of dollars behind in the area. Right. Yeah, you guys have a Boeing plant there. We do. I didn't know we, that. It makes the seven eighty seven Dreamliner. Wow! So they must have a long runway to get to get them we, out. Right? We were the alternative landing site for the space shuttle oh. uh, for Cape Canaveral when it used to land there, and uh, when they had the Ryder Cup here a few years ago, when the Concorde was still flying, the Concorde buzzed the university and then landed at the airport. It was quite impressive because they won the the Europeans won the Ryder Cup when it was here in hmm. Charleston. Well, the things you learn on a microbiology podcast, I'm telling <laughs> well, you, Well, I brought it up because it was golf. I, I thought it, it would brighten <laughs> I Michelle's day that. after spending two days in a retreat. How is no golf, golf, Michelle? Are you still playing? I Yeah, I am. I played on Sunday. I played on Friday. You'll be able to play another month or so. It's warm enough. You know, this week, it's we're in the 60s. It's pretty nice. It's cool. That's the best time to play golf in All the right. 60s. Mm. But the leaves make it difficult. If you don't keep it on the fairway, it's... Hard to find your ball. Mm, yeah, they don't they don't sweep uh, off the fairway, right? They don't get rid of the leaves. Well, they can't keep up with the with the wind. They keep blowing. dropping them. Mm. Yeah, but There's it's beautiful. Not an the leaves app for that. There's not the leaves have turned here. We've got beautiful fall colors, nice. so it's it's great here in College Town. Enjoy. Thanks. That's it for Twim eighty nine. You'll find this episode as well as all the others on iTunes, also at microbeworld dot org slash twim. Always free, the entire archive for your listening pleasure. So check it out all the way back to number one. And if you do have questions or comments, we love to get them. Send them to twim, T-W-I-M, at twiv.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Thank you for having me. And for doing that paper. And um, we all wish you luck at getting your golf ball through those leaves there. <laughs> Thanks. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. Michael, are the leaves falling there? Uh, no. Not yet. Uh, they're, they, and when they do fall, it's like in January. Oh, my gosh. The South. Yes, the South. Global climate change is here. Interesting. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, in particular Chris Condine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear at the beginning and end of TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 